There we go. Um, so, um, so how's PA4? How are the dots doing? And we'll talk about the midterm after this, but... trying to create a new project for dots but I keep getting this error interesting um, so I would say first of all make sure that um, you know all of your projects are closed um, and it might be complaining about the workspace if things got moved or something um, no source folder exists in the project that's a pretty confusing error message so I'm gonna say try try making sure that that everything is closed um, all of your projects and just do file new uh, Java project and if it's still giving you an error message definitely come by office hours in the morning if you can and let's um, let's take a look at it uh, let's see so yeah, the other thing you can do Yeah, so I was going to say you can change workspace and that that can help sometimes. Um So close out your stuff. And um File, switch workspace, and you can say other, and put in a path and just make sure you point to a, a directory that exists. Um, yeah, just double check the path, um, and it sounds like maybe something got moved somewhere along the way. Um, you can put the workspace inside CSE 223 submissions, just pop it down a few levels. Um, you still may need to move things around somewhere else because I have specific places that I wanted, right? I want a PA4 subdirectory, I think. Um, maybe I called it dots under CSE 223. Um, but yeah, try that, and if not, come by office hours. Yeah, and you can you can use the default workspace and just copy the stuff over to um, to submit it. All right, let's talk about logistics for the midterm. Um, so if, if you've done other classes with me, it's going to be very similar to what we've done in, in 222, for example. Um, so this will show up on Canvas um, as an assignment, not as a quiz. Okay, it'll just look like an assignment, and it will open up at 2 o'clock. Okay, so, so your midterm is 2 o'clock to 2.50 tomorrow. Um, and that's the only time you can take it. So it's not, it's not a choose your time during the day kind of thing. Um, so two o'clock, it will open up on Canvas, and it will it will say, you know, here's your midterm, and it'll be a link to a PDF. So open that up, um, read the questions, write up your answers, and then submit your answers as a PDF. Um, so it's like a homework assignment, basically, but it's the midterm. Um, so you know, I recommend typing this up instead of writing it and scanning it, because typing's faster and cleaner and easier. Um, Definitely save it as a PDF to upload. If you don't know how to do that or you're not sure about it, play around with it before the exam, okay, to make sure that that, um, that doesn't become a, a time issue. Um, so it'll be a series of questions, mostly programming questions, maybe some short answer, true, false kind of things, um, and, and just write up the answers, submit them as a PDF. You can submit multiple times. So if, you know, as you're going, you finish question one, you want to upload that, you can go ahead and upload that. And then if you add on question two and you want to upload that, go ahead and upload questions one and two again and so on. Um, I appreciate it if, you know, the final upload is one file instead of, you know, having to take five or six files and, and 
piece them together myself. Um, but you know, if you're making a document, just keep adding on to the document. But if you want to upload it along the way, totally go ahead and do that. In case, you know, your internet connection goes away at 240, you've got most of the stuff uploaded at least. Um, so there'll be nothing about Eclipse itself. I'm not going to ask you about Eclipse or how to use it or anything like that. I'm not going to ask you anything about the GUI stuff, Swing, um, Window Builder, none of that stuff. That's fair game for the final, but for the midterm, it basically stops when we started talking about PA4. So it'll be all the stuff before that, basically up through and including PA3. I might ask you an occasional question about Eclipse on the final, um, but but probably not. I could ask you how to spell Eclipse. Um, all right, uh, let's see, so logistics. Um, open note, open book. Um, you can use your old programming assignments. You can use your Git repository. Um, you can use the uh, Java documentation right so the things that I keep pulling up from Oracle um, all of that is fair game what you can't do is you can't Google you can't check you can't Skype with your friends um, stuff like that so no Stack Overflow basically no online resources right but if your Git repository is online I'm not gonna say you have to pull all of that down and print it right so so you can use things that you know that are allowed like your own code and stuff um, even if they're they're um, they're in the cloud, um, but you know, test conditions. It's a good question. Who you would Skype with? <laughs> like, who would you trust most? Um, so so um, when you're typing up the stuff, you can use um, a plain text editor. Um, I'm okay if you're using an editor that does syntax highlighting. But I'm going to ask you not to use anything that does syntax completing, not to compile, um, not to use any any tools like that. And this this is also spelled out in the top of the exam. Um, so yeah, don't compile your code, don't run your code. Um, I I would love you to be able to do that, but I don't know how to do that up and set it up in a way that that um that makes it fair for everybody. Um, can we Google Java documentation? So so I'm going to say no. Um, unless you're, you're pinpoint accurate in your, your Googling. So for example, um, right, this is fair game. These pages from Oracle, um, well, they're my own copy, but they're from Oracle. Um, so if you want to bookmark Oracle's documentation, docs.oracle.com, you can do that, right? But if you Google, how do I find the length of a string in Java, you're going to bring up, you know, Stack Overflow and Geeks for Geeks and all that kind of stuff, and we don't want that happening. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and I would say just bookmark docs.oracle.com um, and, you know, bring it out a few levels if you want, if you don't want to go through, you know, all of the classes and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, you're on your honor. Hopefully everybody knows what the goals are here, right? If you accidentally, you know, try to bring up Java Oracle Doc and there's, there's a Stack Overflow in the top three entries, right? I'm just going to trust you not to read it and not to click on it. Um, we're not using a Lockdown Browser. We're not using, you know, iProctor or anything like that. So um, we're all adults. I'm not worried about it. Um, but, you know, I want ground rules there so there's no question later on about, well, I thought we could do such and such and that kind of thing. All right, let's see. Anything else on logistics? Um, so 50 minutes. Um, I will be in Zoom during the class time. I suggest you be on Zoom. I won't play Hendrix in the background. Um, but I'll, I'll be on with my microphone muted. If you have questions, right, you can, you can ping me in chat or use your microphone. Um, you know, I don't know what you're asking in question three, that kind of thing. If there are errors in the exam, which, you know, has been known to happen, um, I can, you know, use my microphone and say, hey, question five, um, 
that second part is wrong. I didn't actually mean to make a class for the whole universe. I just meant make a rectangle class. So, um, so it's worth being in Zoom so that you like at least know about corrections on the exam. Um, I will try to give you a heads up a few minutes before time is up. The exam does not automatically close at 2.50. Okay, you can upload after that, but it's due at 2.50. Okay, so it's got that draconian 10 point per minute penalty for late submissions. That's not to be mean, that's to basically say if you accidentally turn it in, you know, half a minute late, you get a 90 instead of a zero. Okay, so it's it's a way to not have it be, you know, this, this sheer cliff that you just drop off and it's like I got a zero because I was 15 seconds late. Um, but it's it's a severe penalty because I don't want you to, you know, take an extra few minutes um, if other people are turning it in on time, so it, it drops off really quickly. So plan on turning it in by 250. Um, if you have an extended time allowance, just take the extended time. Don't worry about the fact that Canvas says your submission is late, right? I've got, uh, you know, record of your extended time and I'll grade it based on that. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's it for kind of logistic details. Um, any questions on that part of the stuff? All right. Um, well, let's talk about topics. So I I didn't make up a formal topic list, but um, but we can do this ourselves. Um, so so you should know Java. Um, so so basic concepts, right? Um, let's see, is this the right area for Eclipse download? Let me see. Yep, that looks right. And you're probably safe just going with the latest one. All right, so you should know Java. No big surprise there. Um, basic ideas, right? So it's interpreted by a Java virtual machine, but it's also compiled. And we compile by saying Java C file name, right? And and that turns it into binary, but it's not binary that runs on your CPU. It runs on a virtual machine called the JVM. So it's it's kind of a combination, both compiled and interpreted. Um, not as fast, maybe, as a purely compiled, but more portable um, than than a purely compiled language, because um, all you have to do is port the interpreter, the JVM. Um, you should obviously know how to compile. Um, you should understand what's going on when you compile a file. So if you have a class named, you know, ha ha, right? Your class name should begin with an uppercase letter. It's not part of the language, but it's best practice. So your class names begin with an uppercase letter. If your class is named ha ha, it goes in a file named ha ha dot java. And when you compile it, you'll get a class named haha.class. So there's there's a wormhole in chat. Um, yeah, so so um, some assembly languages really are interpreted because they run on microcoded machines and you can actually find, you know, the, the micro CPU that's running and interpreting, oh, here's a 0111, that's an, a no-op instruction, so I'll increment the PC and so on. Um, but then it, it does get interesting below that level. If you look at the state machine level, are those ones and zeros being interpreted? Or are they actually, like, ingested by the hardware? Um, and that that's a very interesting black hole. I think it's more than just semantics too. There's there's some cool stuff in there. Um, all right, so so basics of Java, right? Um, 
and and more generally classes and objects so classes are in some sense blueprints for an object so they're a description of what an object will be but they're not an object themselves an object we get when we construct an object using a class as the recipe or the blueprint for that object so you know rectangle is a class this three by five rectangle is an object it's an instance of that that rectangle um, and so you know classes usually start with an uppercase objects usually start with a lowercase so you can quickly tell them apart um, and this is this is you know all part of this idea of object-oriented programming um, so that's that's what 223 is about, right? That's that's why we're doing it more than learning Java or C sharp or something. We're trying to learn object oriented programming. Um, and so so what is this about? Um, one thing is about information hiding. Another is encapsulation. And encapsulation is is probably the bigger the bigger story here. Um, Encapsulation is basically, you know, we're taking code and data and putting them together in this object. So in C, we have a structure. We can take multiple pieces of data and combine them into a single super variable, right? In object-oriented programming, we're also taking code, typically, that, you know, manipulates or works with that data and making that part of the object also. So all that stuff is bundled together. That's kind of what encapsulation is. Information hiding is, is back to this idea of an abstract data type. And if you think of, you know, let's say um, a queue, right? It's a data structure. And what do you do with a queue? You insert into the queue, you remove from the queue, maybe you look to see if the queue is empty, right? That's what the user sees the queue as. It's a way to initialize, see if it's empty, insert, remove. But when you write the code to implement a queue, you might have an array with a head and a tail pointer and a circular uh, buffer. Or you might have a linked list and you insert at one end and you re remove from the other. And you might have a sentinel node. Or you might implement your linked list in an array. All of those details, nothing to do with the abstract notion of a queue. Queue is basically a structure you can insert and remove. Right? And the first thing that you insert is the first thing you remove. So with an object-oriented paradigm, we can hide all of those implementation details. And so we do things like you know, making things private so that we, we actually make it impossible for an outside user to access these internal details. But more importantly, right, we don't require them to interact with these low-level details. So they don't have to know if, if our queue is a list or an array or, you know, magic or something like that. Um, so we have this information hiding. So information hiding and encapsulation, you see those two, you know, presented as kind of the keys to, to uh, object-oriented design. So, yeah, kind of a black box model um, where, where you don't really want to know what's going on inside. This goes in, that goes out. And the implementation is, is not interesting to you, and in fact, it's not accessible to you. So we've, we've got, you know, keywords private and public that we can use to control access to different pieces of our, our classes. And along with private, we have this idea of accessors and mutators. Because sometimes we have pieces of our, our class that um, we do want the user to be able to interact with, but in a very controlled way. So do we, we don't want to just say, you know, hey, here's a stack pointer. Do what you want with it. Go ahead, make it negative. I'm okay with that, right? So, but, but if we want the user to be able to, to look at or manipulate these things, we create methods called accessors and mutators, and we can let them get to these private fields through very controlled mechanisms. So yeah, I might ask you about accessors and mutators, but that's all they are. They're also called getters and setters.
All right, so that's some of the, the, the high-level cocktail party stuff related to object-oriented programming. Um, some of the more nitty-gritties, right? So definitely no basic Java syntax. And you've been writing Java for at least a few weeks now. So, um, you know, if statements, for loops, while loops, um, declaring variables, assigning values to variables, all that stuff, mostly looks like C, right? Um, the stuff that, that um, doesn't deal necessarily with classes is very C-like. The stuff that deals with classes and objects starts to have additional syntax. But, um, you know, basic stuff. Um, so the, the classy stuff, right? So defining a class. So, you know, keyword class, name of the class, curly bracket, blah, blah, blah. And then everything goes inside the curly brackets. Um, so defining a class, uh, constructing an object. So you have a class you want to make an object that's an instance of that class. So if our class is named rectangle, right, it's defined with class rectangle. All the stuff that makes up that class and then a closing curly bracket. When you want to define an object to be an object of type rectangle, it's this. When you want to actually construct a rectangle, it's something like this. Right, where you might have arguments in here or you might not. And you can do this on one line, rectangle r equals new rectangle and so on. This is a definition or a declaration of r, this is a construction of r. And at this point, we would say R is an instance of a rectangle. So that's an object, that's a class. That's an object, that's a class. Um, so constructing an object, um, definitely no public static void main. String bracket bracket args. Right, because I'll probably ask you to write at least one main program, so know how to do this. Um, put it on your notes if you don't. Um, related to this, the idea of a signature. So, um, methods have a name. They have a list of zero or more arguments. Each of those arguments has a type. And the combination of the name and the types of arguments, that's what identifies a particular method. And you can have another method with the same name and almost the same list of arguments, but one of those arguments has a different type. That's a different method. Totally different. Completely independent of this one. So that's what the signature is, right? It's the combination of the, the method name and the types of arguments it takes. And the constructor for a class... looks like a method with one difference. What's, what's the difference between a class constructor and a method? Besides the fact that one constructs a class. But just by looking at it. No return type. Right? Every method has a return type. If it doesn't return something, it's void. Otherwise, it's int, integer, string, rectangle, whatever. But a constructor doesn't specify a return type. That's how you know it's a constructor. Right? Plus, the name of it's going to be the same as the name of the class. All right. So, um, constructors, and then when you want to use the constructor, you use that keyword new to, to actually call the constructor. Um, all right. Other things you should know. Know how to make a state transition table. No, don't know that. Um, know about try-catch blocks. So three-part thing, try catch finally. I will not ask you about extends and implements. So class extensions I decided are like post PA3. All right, try catch finally blocks. So, you know, try curly bracket, list your statements, catch, and remember catch has some type of class name usually exception and then some variable name and then the statements to do there 
So that's the basic setup. And the main thing to know is, you know, the behavior of this. These statements will be attempted. If they succeed, we'll skip the catch block. And if we have a finally block, after these statements succeed, we execute the finally statements. But if anything goes wrong in here, we'll come down to a catch block. And if there's a catch block with either the type of exception we got or something more general, an exception is general enough to catch every exception. So if something goes wrong, we'll come down to a catch block, execute those statements. And then when we're done, we do the finally statements. And when we're in here, this argument has a value which is related to the exception that got us here. Probably the most important punchline to know for this is keep these blocks tight. If you have 50 lines of code and line 13 might cause an exception, don't put all 50 lines inside a try block. Put line 13 in a try block. Right? Be very, very tactical about these. Because, you know, there might be multiple things in your code that could cause exceptions, and you might want to handle them differently. So just put a try block in as small a section of code as possible, the ones that you can't help but possibly have an exception occur. And then handle it, and then, you know, get out of the whole block. Uh, scanners and print writers, definitely fair game. So, um, so know how to construct a scanner um, to read from system.in and to read from a file. So scanner, new file. And the fact that if you open from a file, you have to put it inside a try-catch block. And then scanners, we have these pairs of methods, things like has next and next, has next line and next line, has next int and next int. Mostly we've used line or just, you know, has next and next to read a word at a time. So that's the ingest version. And then print writers is used for writing. And here, when we construct a print writer, it'll usually be with a new file. Or you can just use a, a string for the file name. Um, and then you can do print writer dot print or print ln to do output. Um, still a little fuzzy on print writers. So let's see. So yeah, so this this was an example from one of the sections. Um, print writer is the class name gets imported from here. There's the object I'm making, which is of type print writer. Here's where I construct it, and the argument I pass to it is the name of a file that I want to put some stuff into. It's in the try catch block. If I can't open this file, for example, if I run this from a directory where I don't have write access. I'll get an exception. In this case, it would print out an error message. Otherwise, I can use the name of that print writer's print line method to put a line of output followed by a new line into that file. You have to close it at the end to make sure that your output gets flush. So this should, this should write a table of squares into a file called newfile.txt. So... So if I run that, um, there's a new file.txt. So it works like system.out. Instead of saying system.out.println, which prints to standard out, I can say printwriter.println, which writes to whatever file I named when I constructed the print writer. And that's, that's really kind of all there is to it. And if I, if I don't have permission to write that file, it will throw an exception. In this case, my exception is just causing this, this print message.
Yeah, exactly. Just pretend you're using system out. And use use the name of your print writer object instead. And these these are really powerful. We'll be using these a lot. We'll even use these when we get to networking. And we'll be able to read and write from socketed connections using scanners and print writers. All right, what else? Um, static and non-static. So we use static when we say public static void main, but we'll use it other times as well. For example, if we want to find the square root of a number, we can say math dot square root, assuming these are doubles. And this is a method that we're accessing as a static method in the math class. Right? Most methods that we use, we list the name of an object followed by um, the name of the method. For example, pw.println. pw is an object. But in some cases, we actually use the name of a class followed by the name of a method. That's a static. It's a static method or a class method in this, this math class. And I've, I've asked you not to use static except when you're saying public static void main. So we haven't really done a lot of, of playing with these yet. But that's, that's all that's going on. Um, and if it's not static, then it's, it's an instance method or a non-static method. Um, so arrays... Um, if you have a primitive like an integer or a car or something like that, we can do this almost like we would do it in C. Um, integer bracket bracket data equals new int bracket 10. All right, that makes this an array of 10 integers. It's, it's a primitive, but, but it kind of looks like we're using it as something more. Um, and I could also do this as a declaration. Data is going to be an array of integers and then a construction. Of space for 10 integers. But if you have an object, this is a little different. So let's say we want an 8 by 8 array of boxes. All right, this makes game a legitimate object, which is eight boxes by eight boxes, 64 boxes, two-dimensional array. But if I, if I try to say, you know, let's see if game zero zero's left line has been drawn, right? This is going to give me a null pointer exception unless I construct this box first. So the funny thing with arrays of objects is we have to create them in sort of two phases. This first phase is is creating the array itself, but the boxes are null. Before I can use game 00, zero I need to also construct that box. So something somewhere in some form has to do something like this. Right, this this element of the array has to actually be a box. And so typically we would need to, you know, in our game program, we're going to make a pair of nested loops and construct each of these boxes, maybe inside our, our game constructor. Um, so this declares game, this creates the array, and then this constructs each object in that array. And we saw this in C, right? When you have an array of pointers, you have to allocate space for the array itself, but then you have to allocate space for each of the things that those pointers are pointing to. So it's exactly the same thing here. But with integers, characters, these other primitive types, we can skip this step. And we can just say, um, you know, integer data equals new integer bracket dimensions. 
because we don't construct primitives. That's why they're primitive. All right. Um, you should know about some of our classes like linked list and hash map. And so we use these, you know, in, in, in earlier assignments. So you definitely want to know these. Don't memorize these, right? Just just make your your documentation on these readily available. Um, but you know, we did a few things with linked list. We added, we searched for things, we removed things, hash maps, we added things, we found how many things were in there and so on and so forth. Um, don't spend, you know, time like memorizing those, but you know, take a look through your code and just kind of refresh your memory so that you know what sorts of things are in here. And then if you have to know, you know, write something that tells me how many things are in this hash map, you know, oh yeah, there's a method for that and look through the documentation and find it. Um, What's, what's more interesting in here is that these things are generic, right? So we've definitely used generics. We haven't talked yet about making our own generics. We will, um, but, but we've used them. And so a linked list, for example, works with different types of data. And so we need to specify what kind of object is going to be in our linked list. So when you declare an object and when you construct it you need to have these angle brackets with you know in this case one type which says what kind of thing we have in the list with a hash map we have two generic arguments the first is the type of key and the second is the type of of value associated with the key so you do two types in an angle bracket so review your code and and be okay with that um let's see uh strings so we've done a lot with strings. And again, you don't need to memorize these, but be aware of it, right? So what are the, some, of, some of the things we do with strings? There's a length method, which tells us, you know, how many characters are in the string. There's an equals method, and we can't use equal equal in general. We have to use dot equals. Um, there's a character at, for getting an individual character out of it, there's a two uppercase and there's a two lower case and so on. And there's there's all these other methods, right? But but like I say, you don't have to memorize them. We've been using them, just kind of know that they're there in case you need them. Um, this length method is different from when we have an array like game. It's different from this, right? Which is like a field on the, uh, the variable. So this is actually a method. It's a bunch of code that gets run. Um, related to that, make sure you remember the toString method. And so if a method has a toString method with no arguments, returns a string, um, that's what's used when we need to convert an object into a string, basically, like to concatenate it to another string. We look for a toString method and... Um, and take the return value from that. That's the string version of the object. So we've written those and we've used those, so refresh yourself on those. Um, will it be mostly coding? Yeah. Um, I might have a section with a few short answer, true, false kind of questions, but it'll mostly be writing some code. And I'm thinking, I don't know, you know, maybe four programs or snippets of programs, four or five. Um, and again, you know, in some cases I might say make a class to do this. In some cases I might say show me, you know, a whole program to do this. In some cases it might be show me a method to do this. So make sure you don't do more than I'm asking for, but don't, don't do less. Do just the right amount. Um... And don't forget, you know, the stuff we did in 222. So you should still be comfortable with recursion, right? And we've done recursion in this course. So there could be questions that involve recursion. Um, there could be questions involving, you know, concepts of trees because we've been working with trees or linked lists or things like that. So um, don't forget the stuff we've done before. Um, but, you know, something more than just Java syntax something more relating to data structures, but you know, keeping in mind it's a 50 minute exam, I'll try to, uh, to level it appropriately for the amount of time we have. I think that's 
pretty much it. Um, for Eclipse, you want IDE for Java developers. Um, and um, there's a drop down somewhere where it asks you about Java 11. Um, you might want to go back to the video and see if you can find it. But it's somewhere in that, that installation process. And I think it's just a drop down that defaults to 15. Ah, oh, appreciate the offer. <laughs> Very generous. Uh, let's see. Well, that's pretty much about all I can say on the, um, the exam. Um, so that'll be tomorrow, and hopefully, you know, I'll get it graded over the weekend. And so we can talk about it on, um, on Monday. And next week is week seven. So, um... So this is starting to go really fast. Um, so um, keep working on PA4, and we can keep talking about PA4 next week. Um, but we're going to shift into some new stuff, and I think we're probably going to start next week um, talking about networking. And we'll go through the whole idea of, of sockets and socketed communication. We'll talk about client-server models. Um, and we'll see how to do um, communication using sockets in Java. And it's really painless in Java. When you do this in C, right, in, in future courses, um, it, will be, it will be a different experience. Um, it's a good thing to go through, but, um, but in, in Java, it's pretty painless um, because we have the whole power of objects and classes um, at our disposal. So, so there's a socket class that you know encapsulates all the gory things that we have to do um, line by line if we try to do this in C. So um, so it'll be pretty painless um, and and a good way to get into kind of the whole client server model. So we'll play with that. We'll do a bunch of examples um, and we'll start um, connecting machines together over the network using sockets in Java. So that'll be a lot of fun and that will lead us into PA5, which will be a, a networked version of Dots where two people can play um, from different machines. So, um, so that'll be going on um, starting next week. Um, and then we're going to talk about threads, and there'll be a little bit of threading probably involved in PA5. So we'll get to that um, possibly in the middle of, of sockets. Um, and then we'll go even broader and talk about um, the URL class and um, doing things like you know accessing web pages from Java um, and getting out into the cloud. Um, and that's, that's all fun stuff. And, you know, we can make a browser in about five minutes with Eclipse and, and using some of these classes. So we'll, we'll play with that. Um, and, and that's probably going to take us through most of the course. Um, that'll probably take us into week 10 and then it'll be catching up on a few odds and ends, talking about generics and more stuff with extensions, maybe talking about abstracts and generics and things like that, um, and wrapping up the course, and then we're going to be done. So, um, so we're certainly in the home stretch, and it, it seriously just gets more fun from here on out, because we're playing with much, much bigger toys and tools, um, and we can do more things. Um, so it should be a good time, um, and, and we don't have to do state tables and state machines. So, you know, that's good. All right. Um, that's all I got. Have a good one. I will see you at 2 o'clock tomorrow for your midterm. Um, come by office hours in the morning if you got any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you then. Have a great afternoon. Take care, everyone.